Welcome to Life Point. We're so glad that you're joining us for our gathering today. Whatever the circumstances you find yourself in, I hope that this time of worshiping, praying, giving, and growing will prove to be exactly what you need. In John 10, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Today, we hope you'll see that the abundant life, the good life, the fullest life is found only in Jesus. Please let us know if there are ways that we can pray for you, help you further connect to LifePoint, or help serve you during this season. We invite you to chat with our online pastors during the gathering. So engage with Bibles open, hands lifted, and hearts eager to learn. Stand with us now and let's worship together. Well, church, are you ready to push back against fear this morning? Because that's what happens when we praise our God. So come on, let's sing this with confidence. Come on. I raise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Yeah. I raise the hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise the hallelujah. Deep. 
morning, Life Point. How are you? We're so glad that you are here with us. We're going to start our time in the Word of the Lord. And it says that Psalm chapter 55, verse 22, it says this, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Again, it says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. You know, today, as you have joined us, maybe you have a burden and you're feeling it this week. Maybe it's in the form of anxiety or anger. You just don't know when this thing's gonna pass and it is burdensome. We have hope, church, in this word. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Right now, What I would love for us to do together is to cast our burden on the Lord. And the way we're gonna do that is I want you to say this with me. And it's this, God is in control. Would you say that right now? God is in control. Kids, if you hear me, let's say it one more time. God is in control. If you are with us, on Facebook or on YouTube, in that chat window, would you just put in there, say, God is in control. And when you're doing that, have that be a posture of prayer, inviting the Lord in that moment as you text that out. Maybe you're standing there or sitting on the couch or we don't know where you are, but would you just pull out your phone and right now someone's coming to your mind that needs to hear you from you Speak this truth out and say, God is in control. It's okay, this is the time for you. Yes, you can use your phone and you probably already are. But uh, just text that out to someone who needs to hear from you. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's a friend. Just declaring and saying and letting them hear that God is in control. He's not far away from us, he is with us. Now with that truth that we've just declared, Let's go before the Lord, let's close our eyes, let's bow our heads. And just in a posture of prayer right now, we declare, God, you are in control. Maybe we haven't been living it and and believing that truth this week, God. But we, in faith, declare and say that you are holding everything in your hands. We trust you today. We worship you, we we sing songs of praise in the midst of a valley, in the midst of darkness. And as Brad declared at the very beginning of our gathering together, we're gonna push back the darkness with praise. You inhabit the praises of your people. So God, would you take your rightful place on our hearts, on these songs, in our homes, wherever we are, God, take your rightful place for you are in control. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, amen. Oh 
is well with my soul. It may not feel like it, but we sing this with belief in our hearts. is in control. So let's sing this together this morning, filled with faith and hope. Come on, lift your voice. From the highest of mountains into the depths of the sea. From the planets in motion to the breath that we breathe. From the womb of the bear to the rich and the poor to the dreams of the orphan. Come on, we believe this. Every heartbeat is yours. Sing this out. Oh, you hold it all. Drive every nation, every country and king, every song, every language, every song that we sing. Oh, come on, sing it out.
We stand in this moment with our eyes closed, with our hearts towards you. All of our focus and attention is on you. And right now we declare the name of Jesus. Would you just say that with me, Jesus? Speak his name, Jesus. Come on kids, say Jesus. Come on adults, Jesus. The name that holds everything together. He is in our midst today. He's the one who is holding us together in this time of crisis and uncertainty. Jesus, we worship you, we praise you, we thank you for that truth, that you are in control and that you hold all things. It's in your name we pray, Jesus Christ, amen. Hey, LifePoint. My name is Eddie Gonzalez. I serve as director of our Hispanic ministry. And each week we worship and open up God's word together in the same way you do in this gathering. The difference is that we do it in Spanish. And because of that, we're able to minister to many new and otherwise unengaged people each week. Because of the way that you faithfully give to the ministry of LifePoint, we're able to help Spanish speakers in Middle Tennessee find life in Jesus. So thank you for your generosity. We hope you'll continue to give faithfully so people of every tribe and tongue and nation can continue to access the Word of God in their own native language. I want to encourage you to visit lifept.org slash give to learn more about how to continue in your faithful giving during this season. Again, thank you for being a generous church. I hope that God will richly bless you as you continue to help people find life in Christ and live set in the world. Hello, Life Point. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to worship. I am absolutely thrilled at how you have leaned in. We challenged you at the beginning of this thing to lean in, don't lay back, and you have. You have leaned in with worshiping online. You have leaned in in generosity. You have not laid back for one moment, and I am honored and proud to be your pastor. And if you are watching from anywhere in the world, maybe you're not a part of Life Point, but you joined us because someone shared it from their Facebook page, and you saw it on your stream. Thank you for being here. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. We are in the midst of a series called He Still Holds It All. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how God is still in control no matter what's going on in our world. You know, I heard about a rodeo clown who was applying for health insurance. And as he applied for health insurance, his agent asked him if he had had any accidents in the last five years. And he said, no, I haven't had any accidents. And the agent said, well, I'm looking through your paperwork and man, I, I see a, a lot of ER visits. Explain those. And he said, well, five years ago, I was gored by a bull and it broke my leg. Two years ago, a Bronco kicked me in the ribs and broke three ribs. Last year, my wife ran over me in the driveway and broke my foot. And his agent said, well, you don't call those accidents. And the rodeo clown said, no, they weren't accidents. They did those things on purpose. <laughs> you know, that's sort of a warped perspective, but it's really a pretty accurate perspective because I don't believe anything just happens. I don't believe there's really anything that's arbitrary. God is in control of all things. And that's what we want you to understand. That's what we think will give you peace and help you bear up and get through and stay strong in these days of uncertainty. You know, uh, this coronavirus pandemic has created this uncertainty that abounds, right? I mean, it's, we're living in times of uncertainty. It makes 2019 seem like the good old days, really. I mean, you remember the good old days, the good old days when we could like take our wife out to eat, when we could go to work. I mean, that sort of makes your commute less, you know, uh, hateful, right? I mean, you just, you don't hate that commute as much now. You almost would like to have that commute, but you remember when we could go to work, when our kids could go to school, when we could go out to eat, when we could go to church. You remember those, the good old days of 2019. Well, 2020, we're filled with days of uncertainty. And you know what? Uncertainty brings no little amount of stress. It's stressful. But here's what I want you to know. Days of uncertainty are not new. 
Matter of fact, uh, days of uncertainty have been with us since sin crashed the party in Genesis chapter three. And so we're doing this series to help you know how to not just live in days of uncertainty and not just survive, but to thrive, to, to dwell in them and to absolutely build God's kingdom in the midst of them, okay? And so, so what we're doing is we're looking at biblical characters who lived in days of uncertainty. And let's face it, they all did, right? I mean, all biblical characters had uncertain times in their lives and, and they lived in them and didn't just live, didn't just survive, but they thrived and they kept building God's kingdom. And so what can we learn from them? And that's what we're looking at in this series to try to help you navigate these times. Last week, R.C. Ford, our Stewart's Creek campus pastor, he talked about Noah. What an amazing story. Talk about times of uncertainty. I mean, God told Noah, you're gonna have to shelter in place in a huge ship with just your family and a bunch of animals for a lot of months. Now, I don't know about you, but man, that would make me uncertain, right? And so Noah, we know, did exactly what God said, and as a result, we're blessed by what he did. So we want you to bless. We uh, People that come after you, your kids, your family, all those who will come after us, we want them to be blessed by how we lived in this time of uncertainty like Noah. Now, what we learned last week is when it rains, God still rains. Today, what we're gonna learn is your pit is a part of God's plan. Your pit, you, you, we find ourselves in pits all the time, and we don't know if we can dig out of those pits, right? But your pit is a part of God's plan. We're gonna shift gears. We're gonna talk about a man named Joseph. Now, I'm gonna tell you that Joseph, who was Jacob's son in Genesis, he, it's one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. I mean, because his life absolutely screams God still holds it all no matter what's going on right? Joseph, I, I preached a series on him years ago. And so I want to revisit some of that series because it was so relevant. It is, his life is so relevant for today. So I want to re rework it. And I want to look at his life and then apply it to COVID-19 and how living in this time of uncertainty, Joseph can help us live in this time and thrive in it, okay, and build God's kingdom. And so, so as, as we look at this, uh, Joseph's life is just absolutely, it, it's a picture. It screams, God still holds it all. When you don't understand what's going on, when you feel like you keep getting kicked, man, when you get hit with a left hook, when life takes a left-hand turn, I mean, God still holds it all. When your spouse uh, maybe walks out the door, when you lose your job or when your kids lose their mind or when the stock market plummets or when a virus just rocks your world and seems to take over the world, God still holds it all, okay? Now, Joseph, Joseph, he, he was the great grandson of a man named Abraham. Maybe you remember Abraham. Maybe you're not uh, familiar with the story. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you haven't been in church long and you're not familiar with his story. Abraham was not a Christ follower, so to speak. Man, he was in the Old Testament, right? So he didn't love God. He didn't follow God, right? And so, so he was a Mesopotamian idol worshiper, but God went to him and he spoke to him and he said, Abraham, you go where I tell you and I'm gonna bless you. God promised to bless Abraham. He didn't bless him just so that he would be, uh, uh, have the biggest house in the neighborhood with his blessings. You know, what blessings wasn't just for himself. He blessed him so that he would bless the neighborhood. I'm gonna bless you to be a blessing. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? And so, so we go from Abraham and Abraham has a son named Isaac. Then Isaac has a son named Jacob, also known as Israel. And then Israel, or Jacob, had 13 kids. He had 12 sons, 13 kids by four women, by the way. Now, imagine that. Uh, just to give you a little perspective, if you were sheltered in place today with 13 kids, man, you'd be like, what? And so that was Jacob. He had 13 kids by four different women. He had 12 sons. And Joseph was one of those sons, and those 12 sons would become the 12 tribes of Israel, the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. He had one daughter, that's a tough girl. You got 12 brothers, one girl, that's a tough girl, okay? And so, so Jacob had 13 kids by four different women, and listen, it was a dysfunctional family. They put the fun in dysfunctional. I mean, if we were to line up and to absolutely try to figure out who is the most dysfunctional families in the history of the world, you got a Homer Simpson and Jacob. They'd run neck and neck for who would win because both families were very dysfunctional, okay? Let's, let's read the story here. And kids, if you are in the room watching with your parents worshiping, grab your Bibles. If you've got your Bible, parents, maybe you wanna pull your kid up on your lap uh, to read your Bible 
Bible uh, or you know, read it on the screen with them. If you've got your kid's Bible, that's awesome. Uh, but but let's, let's read in Genesis 37. Let's set the story by reading just a little bit here. In Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4, it says, Now Israel, which was Jacob, remember he became known as Israel, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, folks, Joseph's brothers hated him. Why did they hate him? Because he was daddy's favorite. And here was the thing. Daddy didn't even try to hide it. I mean, daddy rubbed it in their nose. He was his son of his old age. He rubbed it in their nose. He bought Joseph this basically uh, Armani multicolored fat coat that was just amazing, right? And he took his uh, the, the other brothers to bargain hunt to get their clothes, right? I mean, it would have been like buying Joseph a, a brand new Hummer when he turned 16. And the other boys, I'll tell you what, we're going to go get you a 2000 Ford Escort, right? Or something like that. I mean, if you drive an Escort, that's a cool car. It's just a comparison there. And so, so Joseph was daddy's favorite. His brothers, man, they, they hated him for it. And Jacob should have known better because this was his life. He lived this life. He had firsthand experience with this, a front row seat to it. Not just a front row seat, but he was a star in the play of this. If you'll remember, when his daddy Isaac, uh, when he was born, he was born a twin. He had a twin, his brother named Esau. And his daddy was Isaac. Well, his daddy loved Esau. Made, Made no bones about it. Esau's my favorite. His mama loved him more. Jacob was mama's boy, right? And it, this, this whole favoritism thing just created this storm that tore their family apart. It got so bad that Esau literally wanted to kill Jacob and was going to. Jacob had to run. His mama had to say, you got to run and get away. He's going to kill you. So he ran, got away, and he had to stay away from his family for 20 years. Not around anyone he knew, anything he knew for 20 years because of the sin of favoritism. It will destroy your family, parents. Listen, here's one life lesson that you can learn from this, mom and dad. You got multiple kids, do not under any circumstances allow the sin of favoritism in your home because it will do brutal things to your family. It will just absolutely rip your family apart, right? And so, so Joe, Joseph here, we, you can call him Joe for short, but Joseph, he, he had two dreams. Going back to his story, he had two dreams. One, in one dream, he and his brothers were out in the field binding sheaves, right? It was an agrarian society and binding sheaves was a part of, of what they did. So he was out in the field binding sheaves and their sheaves bowed down to his sheaf, right? Then in the second dream, the sun, the moon, the stars all bowed down to him. Now, I'll just give you a piece of advice here. If you are a younger brother and you have a dream that you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and your uh, brothers are the guys who go get your coffee and drive you around, I wouldn't tell them, all right? But see, Joseph, he he had a little privilege in him, right? I mean, he was born with a spoon, you know, a silver spoon, and and he, he sort of lived that life and he liked it. And so he played it up a little bit. He told his uh, brothers the dreams, sort of throwing it in their face, rubbing it in their face. And and when he told them these dreams, man, they hated him before. Now, they I'm gonna kill him. We hate this dude and we're gonna kill this dude, okay? Now, here's another life lesson. Jealousy, bitter, and enviness will rot your soul. That's what we see in these brothers, right? I mean, jealousy and bitter and envious. There's always gonna be someone that makes more money. There's always going to be someone that has bigger houses. There's going to be someone that drives better cars, that gets all the girls, right, guys? I mean, there's always going to be that guy. There's always going to be that, that girl that, 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 you know, gets all the likes on her Facebook and everybody looks at her stuff and she has, she, she, you know, she, she, she drives the, the, the better cars always. And if you get jealous, bitter and envy, bitterness and envy, it will rot your soul. So we got to put those things to rest. Favoritism, put it to rest. Jealousy, bitter, enviness, put them to rest. There's a couple of life lessons right out of the gate, okay? And so, so his brothers hated him. And so, so here's what happened. One day, Joseph comes in and his dad, Jacob, says, Joe, I need you to go check on your brothers. They were in a town called Shechem, tending the flock. And Joseph, Jacob had a history in Shechem. 
Shechem was the prince of the town, and his name was Shechem, and so the town they named Prince. I mean, they named Shechem, and so uh, 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 Prince, man, I, I, that that was uh, you know one of my rock dudes in the, in, in the '80s as I was growing up, right? They named the town after the prince, and his name was Shechem. And so, so in Shechem, here's what happened: his daughter Dinah, Jacob's daughter Dinah, met the prince of Shechem, named Shechem. He took her, and he wanted her, and she said no, and he didn't know that no means no, right? And he had his way and after, against her will. And after all of that, he wanted to marry her. He fell in love with her. And he said, I want her to be my, my wife, and I'm a prince. And so he went to Jacob, and he said, I want your daughter, and, and I, I, I'll give you any bride price that you want for her. Now, his brothers heard about this. They were furious, okay? They were furious, especially a few of them. They were furious. And so they said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. They concocted a plan to get revenge. They told the men of of Shechem, they said, I'll tell you what we'll do. You can marry our daughter, but you have to be circumcised like we are. And if you get circumcised, that's a part of the bride price, then we'll give you our sister. We'll, Jacob will give you his daughter. And so the guys agreed to it. Shechem said, okay, I'll agree to it. And then he had all the men in the, in the, in the city to be circumcised. Well, after circumcision, as an adult man, you're down for the count. And so while they were down for the count, this was their plan. While they were in recovery, they went in, went Rambo on these dudes and slaughtered every man in the city, took their sister, went home. Okay, so they got their revenge, vengeance. His mind says, Lord, do not be vengeful. It's another life lesson. But anyway, they're there in Shechem guarding the sheep. Jacob has history there. And so he tells Joseph, hey, son, go check on your brothers. I'm worried about them. Joseph takes off. He goes to find them. He can't find them in Shechem. Someone tells him, yeah, they went to Dothan. He goes to Dothan. All of a sudden, his brothers look up. They see someone coming on the horizon. And they look up and they say, oh, it's, Who is it? Somebody's coming. And then somebody recognizes his sweet coat, right? And they say, oh, it's that dreamer. It's that punk kid brother of ours. And they started, I mean, gritting their teeth. And all of a sudden they said, hey, this is our opportunity, boys. We're way, we're a long way from home. No one will ever know. Right now is our time to kill this dreamer, get him out of our life for good, right? It's 11 against one. He literally has no, absolute no chance. And so they concoct this plan to kill him. But one of the brothers had a conscience. His name was Reuben. Reuben said, hey, I tell you what, let, let's not kill him. Let's, let's throw him in a pit. He is our brother. I don't want him to die by our literal hands. Let's throw him in a pit and let an animal get him or just let him die of starvation or hunger. We won't get our blood on our hands. We won't get our hands dirty with it. Let's just do that. And the brothers liked it. It, it seemed right to them. And so, so they took him, stripped him of his coat, smacked him around a little bit and threw him in the pit to let him die. Reuben's plan, however, was to return, rescue Joseph, and take him home to daddy and be the hero, basically, okay? So, so they throw him in a pit, and then they go get some Chick-fil-A or something. Some guy brings in Chick-fil-A, Christian chicken, and they're set down to eat. And as they're eating, Joseph's in a pit. I'm sure he's probably screaming. He's probably yelling, trying to talk sense into them. I mean, he's probably beating up a little bit, uh, but he's maybe crying. I mean, all these things. And so they're up there eating, heartless, basically. And one of the brothers named Judah. Now, Judah becomes the father of the tribe of Judah. Jesus will come through the tribe of Judah, right? And so Judah looks up and he sees this caravan of Ishmaelites coming on a trade route. They're going to Egypt to trade. Judah says, bam, I got it, guys. Here's what we'll do. We'll get him up out of the pit. We'll sell him to the Ishmaelites. They'll take him to Egypt and sell him as a slave. Our dad will never see him again. He's not going to go to Egypt. Our dad will never see him again. He's going to be far from home. We won't get any blood on our hands, and we'll get a little pocket cash for our trouble. And all the guys are like, bro, that is the plan right there. So they did exactly that. They got him out of the pit. They took him to the Ishmaelites sold him. They took him to Egypt. What happened was his brothers then took his sweet coat, you know, the favorite child coat. They took that coat, ripped it up, put animal blood on it, took it home to daddy and let him just assume that a wild animal had torn his son to pieces. And they sat by and watched as as their daddy day after day just mourned. They're heartless, right? I mean, they're heartless. And Joseph is taken to Egypt and he is sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar. It's all there in Genesis 37 to a man named Potiphar, who is the captain of the guard, basically the chief of police for Pharaoh. Joseph is now one degree 
from the most powerful man in the most powerful country in the world, okay? And so, so think about this. This is just Genesis 37, this story. Now, as we look at this story, there's a lot that we can learn from it, right? I mean, Joseph is on top of the world. Man, he is going to work one day. He's on a commute. He's probably fussing about the commute, complaining about the commute. I mean, he goes out to eat, takes it for granted. You know, I mean, he goes to the movie, takes it for granted. Next day, man, he's sheltered in place, we could say, right? I mean, in other words, one day, Joseph's on top of the world. His daddy's gonna give him the family business. I mean, man, he is literally rocking the coat. I mean, he's got the privilege. Everything's going Joseph's way until it doesn't. All of a sudden, out of left field, He takes a right hook, an uppercut. Life takes a left turn, sharp left turn. And now he's went from the palace to the pit, right? He's went from the palace to the pit. And here's what Joseph didn't know in the moment. Think about his emotions. When he's in that pit, he's thinking, he's thinking he's gonna die at first. And and then he goes to Egypt as a slave. And all of a sudden he's thinking, man, I, I I had the good life. I had the high life, man. I had it all. And now I've got nothing. He didn't realize when he was in that pit that the pit was a part of God's plan. Your pit is a part of God's plan. And that's what I wanna, that's really what I wanna focus on. I wanna learn two things from this story about the coronavirus, COVID-19, and any other pit you're in right now. Because you see, we are all in the pit of the coronavirus, but some of you are in a pit of a marriage that's wonky right now. Some of you are in a pit of a child that's sort of lost his mind. Some of you maybe have lost your job. Some of you maybe you got a bad medical report. There's all kinds of pits out there. And we can be in that pit saying, man, what? I mean, a month ago, things were great. Yesterday, things were great. Today, I don't know what's going on, God. It seems like I keep getting kicked. What is up, right? And so there are two things that I, I wanna learn from this that I think will help you greatly live in this moment and, and embrace it and thrive in it right? And the first thing is this, you can trust in God's providence. Trust in God's providence. Now, the doctrine of providence is, if you boil it down, it basically says this, God is in control of every event, action, and, 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 and atom, and molecule, and, and anything in life, God's in control. There is nothing outside of God's control. Okay, that's basically the doctrine of providence. It's a major, major theme in the Bible. No moment is outside of God's control. No virus is outside of God's control. No job loss is outside of God's control. No health issue is outside of God's control. It's a major theme in the Bible. And I wanna read just a few verses. And I could, I could really read verses for the next hour, okay? But I, I won't. I wanna give you a sampling because I want you to see this clearly. And let me read them. And then we're gonna come back and and, and look at this and how they apply specifically to now, but every area of life. I encourage you to memorize these verses, mark them down. I'm gonna read many so you might have a hard time flipping to them, so write them down. Go back and memorize them. Know where they are so that you can always go because when life throws you a curveball, you go to these and know, listen, it's not arbitrary. God has it. God's still in control, all right? God still holds it all. Look at Ephesians 1.11. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined According to the purpose of him, get this, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things. All things means your job. All things means your marriage. All things means your kids. All things means the coronavirus. It's all working according to his will. It's not out of his control. Look at Job 37, 5 through 13. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. We can't comprehend it. That's, that's, that's a point here. You can't comprehend all that God's doing in the moment. When you're in a pit, you can't comprehend it. Our minds can't comprehend it. Look, for to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, to the downpour, his mighty downpour, he seals up the hand of every man that all men who he made may know it. Then the beast of the, uh, the beasts go into their layers and remain in their dens. For its cham- from its chambers comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given, and by the broad waters, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with his moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance. Sounds sort of like a whirlwind, a tornado, a lot of things. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love. Get this last phrase. He causes it to happen. The weather is in God's control. The rain falls where God tells it. It doesn't fall where God tells it not to fall. The snow, the ice, the whirlwinds, the tornado, 
all, everything is in God's control. He causes it to happen, whether for correction or for his land or out of love. We can't comprehend it all, but it's all in God's control. It doesn't just happen, okay? Job 12, 23, he makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. He brings nations up. If it's a world superpower, America is a superpower today. We didn't get here because we're smart, because we're industrious. We got here by God's hand, but so did Egypt. So did Rome. They're no longer world superpowers. We must remember who put us here and who can also take us down. That's what it says. He, 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 he raises up and he brings down. The king's heart, Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Leaders today are making decisions and we can think, oh, that, that God's in control of every decision. No matter whether someone follows him, he's still in control of them right? He controls every leader's decision. He puts people in places. Acts 27, I mean, I'm sorry, Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Listen, you live where you live today by God's plan. Man, whether you're in Middle Tennessee or whether you're in California or North Carolina or whether you're in Brussels or Bangkok or Paris or whether you're in, in, in Africa, whether you're in South America, you are there right now. And some of you say, well, you know, I'm here because I met a woman who lived here or I married my husband and this is where he's from or we have children who move there, we're retired, we move there or I have a job there. All those things are great things. That's the way God used maybe to get you there, but you're where you are by the plan of God according to his word. You're exactly where you are according to his word, for his glory. It doesn't just happen. Nothing is arbitrary. Psalm 139, 16 says, for your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Every day of your life is written by God. Your birthday, your last day. I was born November the 18th, 1966. That's my birthday, right? Put it on your calendar. You know, I, I, I'll take money, cash, gift cards. It doesn't matter, right? But my point is, I was born November the 18th, 1966. I don't know when I'm gonna die. God does. I can work out, I can exercise, and I can eat clean. And I should do all those things because I should be a steward of the body God gave me, right? But here's what I want you to know. You can run a marathon every month and you will not prolong your day one moment. You will not prolong your life one moment beyond what God has established for you. Cannot happen. Your birthday, your first day, your last day is set, right? Now, you can't prolong them, but you can sure feel better in them. That's why you need to, another reason why you need to work out and eat healthy and eat clean, right? To, to, so that your body is healthy and so that you're a steward of what God has given you. Take care of it, right? But God is in control of the day you die. It's in God, it's not arbitrary, right? That ought to make you absolutely have comfort and peace on all these things. So here's what we learn about all these verses, right? And there's more, and I could go on and on and on and on, because that's what the Bible's about. God's sovereign. He still holds it all. He still holds it all. Nothing is arbitrary. God is in control of every moment, every action. He is in control of every animal. He's in control of every atom, and he is in control of every virus, folks. He's in control of it. And sometimes, as Job said, our minds can't comprehend it. We just can't grasp it all, it's so fast, right? I mean, it's hard for us to look when tornadoes, just a month or so ago, when tornadoes ripped apart Middle Tennessee, and they've ripped apart other parts of the country, maybe where you're watching now. And maybe you're in a place where a hurricane rips it apart, or, 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 or an earthquake, right? And when that happens, it's like, I, I can't see how that's good. We can't comprehend it. But here's what the scripture says, God is in control. It didn't happen apart from his knowledge or apart from his hand. He causes it to bring glory to him and to bring good to you, even though it might not seem good. How can the coronavirus shutting the world down be good? How can people losing their jobs be good? I mean, how, how can, can not be able to go to church? How can it be good? How can people dying in a hospital without their family there because they won't let their family come. How can that be good? How can weddings be, have, be canceled or have to go online and no one there to celebrate? Or funerals, people be buried with only eight people present. How can any of that be good? You know, I, I understand those questions. When this first happened and I, I, I thought, man, we can't literally meet in person. I mean, I, I was devastated. I'm like, God, what is going on? How can that be good, right? And God immediately reminded me, hey, 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 Pat, listen, I'm doing something. You see this as a pit, 
and it is in my plan. It is in my plan. I can't comprehend all that God is doing, but like Joseph, here, here, here's, here's what I know. God has a plan. He's working that plan. And he can either, we, I can either hate the pit or I can look forward to what God's doing in the pit to bring glory to himself and good to me, right? So what we can do is trust in God's providence. He's in control of the coronavirus. He's in the control of COVID-19. He can take it away tomorrow if he wants, or he can prolong it until he accomplishes what he wants to accomplish. It's not arbitrary. He's in control. So is every pit you're in, your marriage, your money, your kids, your health, everything God is in control of. That ought to give you peace in this pit and in every pit. And then secondly is trust in God's plan or lean into God's plan, right? Think about Joseph. As I said, Joseph was on top of the world, man. He's getting ready to take over daddy's business. He is on top of the world, folks. All of a sudden, bam, he gets hit out of left field with an uppercut, right hook, however you want to say it. I mean, he's getting ready to get handed the keys to the business and now he's in, in a pit and he in, ends up in, in, as a slave in Potiphar's house. Joseph's got to be thinking, this is not how I planned it, and I don't know how this is going to be any good. I don't know how any, I, I, all these plans I had, now they're not going to come to fruition. Uh, uh, man, this is out of control. What happened, right? But here's what was happening. God was working. God had a plan, right? Think about Joseph for just a moment, right? I mean, Joseph, as he goes to Egypt, he is, goes into Potiphar's house, and and you know, he goes into the captain of the guard and we know the end of the story. We're gonna talk through his story in the coming weeks. God raises him up eventually to be the number two man in the entire nation, the vice president of the most powerful nation in the world. Now, to, to lead a nation, man, you gotta know their language. You gotta know their culture. You gotta know their business principles and, and, and how they conduct business. That's exactly what God did. He took Joseph and he put him in Potiphar's house. We'll learn that Potiphar began to love him so much because Joseph loved the Lord. And when Joseph loved the Lord, he did what the Lord said. So he did the job the best he could do as responsible. He could trust him because he was honest. And he put him in charge of his entire household. Nothing that he had was not in charge of, uh, under the charge of Joseph. He basically gave him the pin numbers to his credit cards and he gave him the keys to, to his home. He gave him everything, right? And said, Joseph, you're in charge of it. That's how much he loved Joseph and trusted Joseph. So Joseph was learning business. Joseph was learning the language. He was learning the culture. And all of a sudden, things were going good for Joseph again. And then bam, here's what happened. Pharaoh's wife, I mean, I'm sorry, not Pharaoh, but Potiphar's wife, man, she all of a sudden, she had an eye for this young Hebrew boy. He was a young boy, a strapping boy in shape, and he was a Hebrew boy. She was an Egyptian woman. She had, a, she, she had her eye on this young Hebrew boy, right? And she, all of a sudden, she invited Joseph over and wanted to do a little adult nap time with Joseph, so to speak, right? And she wanted to spend a little time with Joseph, and Joseph said, no, I'm not going to, because first off, I love my God, and my God says no. Second off, I work for a man who trusts me with everything and I'm not gonna dishonor him. I'm not gonna do it. She keeps on and keeps on and keeps on because listen, she's used to getting what she wants. She's a powerful woman, an attractive, powerful woman. She's used to getting what she wants. She doesn't let up. Joseph finally says, no, no, no. And so he starts to run away to get out, which is exactly what scripture says, flee the appearance of evil, right? So he starts to run away and when he, he starts to run, she grabs him, his robe comes off, he has, she has his robe in her hand and you, you've heard the saying, hell hath no fury like a scorned woman. Well, that's true and here's what happened. She, all of a sudden, a woman used to getting what she want, can't, wants, can't have him. She said, I'm gonna lie and I'm gonna show him. She lied and said that he took her by force and they threw him in prison. Here he is again, man. He can't catch a break, right? I mean, he keeps getting kicked, right? But now, guess what? He's learned business. He's learned the language. He's learned the culture. He's now in prison. Again, he's going, what is this pit, God? I don't understand this pit. This pit is part of God's plan, right? You gotta trust God's plan. God had Joseph in this place to raise him up and it was all a part of God's plan. He was learning the business. He was learning the culture. He was learning the language. And then through a set of miraculous circumstances that we'll talk about later, God raises him up to be the vice president of the entire most powerful country in the world. It's an amazing story. 
Here's what we don't know. We don't know God's plan. Our minds can't comprehend it all. Totally. No, we know some of God's will. We know it's God's will for us to share the gospel. We know it's God's will for us to live holy lives and all those things. But what we don't know, we don't know exactly what God's doing. We don't know what he's doing in our marriage. We don't know what he's doing with our kids. We don't know what he's doing with money. We don't know what he's doing with the coronavirus. We don't know. And we can be frustrated. And folks, I want to tell you, I have been frustrated in this, right? I've been more frustrated than fearful, to be honest, because, man, we're not able to meet together. And I love you. And I want to meet with you. We're not able to meet together. I'm a pastor. Pastors deal with people. And I want to be with people, right? My people. And so, man, I've been frustrated. And I'm thinking, what good's going to come out of this? But here's what I know. God always comes back and says, Pat, trust in my providence. Lean into my plan. I've got a plan. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. And so I can hate the moment or I can love the, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the guaranteed promise that this pit is a part of God's plan. You can too. You can too. That can help you not just bear up under this, but thrive within it, okay? Now, if you are a, uh, not a believer in Jesus Christ, first off, I wanna say thank you for being here today. Thank you that you have stayed to the end. Maybe you saw this on Facebook. Someone shared it on the stream and uh, shared it and you saw it on your stream. You said, I wanna check this out. And I, for whatever reason, man, God brought you here and you stuck. Thank you for watching. Maybe th this is uh, the church of one of your friends or your family and you decided to check us out. Thank you for watching. But if you don't know Jesus, here's what I want you to know. Jesus is the greater Joseph, okay? Joseph, think about this. Joseph was in a pit. He had to go to prison, but it was all so that he could be raised up to be the second in command, okay? Now, Jesus is the greater Joseph, and I say that because jo Jesus came to this world fully God, fully man. Unlike Joseph, he lived a perfect life without sin. Joseph had sin, Jesus did not. He lived a perfect life, absolute, the only person who, who ever lived that did not deserve to die, but he didn't just die, he was brutally tortured and brutally murdered, died. And that seemed so unjust, that pit seemed, he was put in the tomb, that pit seemed so unjust, and it seemed like what is the good, what, is, what good can come out of that? But see, we know that on the third day, he came out of the grave. See, he was put in the pit of death to defeat it, right? That pit is a part of God's plan to defeat it so that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? And so we're saved by grace, God's amazing grace, not our efforts. And so if you don't believe in him or if, you, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I wanna to tell you, you can be. How? It's not by earning it. It's not, by, it's not by earning it. It's not by doing more good than bad. It's by believing in Jesus Christ and surrendering to him as your Lord and Savior, proclaiming Jesus as Lord by, 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 by believing in him. And if you don't know how to do that, listen, we would love to help you. There's a card. There's a section on the online platform that you're on right now that you can fill out, and we will get back to you really soon. So I would say if you're not a believer, the first thing to do is let us know. We want to help you understand who Jesus is and how he can change your perspective to help you to understand that the pit that you're in is a part of God's plan. Maybe if you're not a believer, his plan was to bring you to this moment to bring redemption and salvation. You see, Joseph was put in the, to be the, the second in command in, in Egypt to redeem his family, right? To redeem not just family, but the entire nation of Israel. That's why he was there. Jesus defeated death to redeem all who would believe in him. Maybe that's a part of his plan for you right now. Maybe this pit was to get you to watch, to get you to worship so that you'd say, wow, I need Jesus. If you're not a believer, would you do that right now? Let us know. Fill out that section on the online platform so that we can get back to you. If you are, oh, folks, here's what I want you to know. I know that the coronavirus is a pit. It's a real, it's a, it's, it's a pit that we all detest right now. We're tired of hearing about it, I know. Okay, I am, you are, uh, the, the COVID-19 thing. Man, we all want it to go away. But that's just one of many pits. You know, maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe your finances are struggling. Maybe your kids are struggling. Maybe your single mom who's struggling, right? And, and if, if, if you're in a pit right now, I want you to rest assured, if you know Jesus, then all things work together in accordance with the counsel of his will. Whatever pit you're in, it's not an accident. It's not arbitrary. God's in control of it. It's a part of his plan. He's doing something. He hasn't turned his back on you. He's not walking away from you. He's not absent from you. It's a part of his plan, right? He's doing something. Lean into that and let it change your mentality to say, man, I, I, I don't really wanna be in a pit, but I just absolutely can't wait to see what God's doing in it, right? And so your pit is a part of God's plan. Learn that, lean on it. 
Trust in the Lord. Trust in his providence. Lean on his plan and let him do amazing things in your life that will completely change your today, your tomorrow, and your future until Jesus returns. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that your word says nothing just happens. There is nothing that is arbitrary. There is literally nothing that's outside of your control. Nothing takes you by surprise. You're not scratching your head trying to figure out what to do with the coronavirus. God, it's been there. Your plan from the beginning, as we read today, scripture after scripture after scripture that says it's all in your hand. The weather, the, the, the animals, people, Lord, every atom, every molecule you've declared is mine. You're in control of it, God. Thank you for the peace that that can bring us, knowing that this virus is not in control of anything. You're in control of the virus, and you're in control of, in control of everything. And God, I pray that we would know in this that we would know you have a plan, even though we can't comprehend it, and that we would rest in the fact that you're doing something. You're doing something in my life, my kid's life, my family's life, my church's life. You're doing something in my community's life. God, you're doing something, and I can't wait to see what that is. We love you, Jesus, and we trust you. We want to tell you how awesome it is to know that things are not just happening to us, but, God, that we know you're in control of all things that are happening all over the world at every moment in any situation. You're in control of every moment, every action, every atom, every molecule. God, we praise you and thank you that all things are working together in accordance with the counsel of your will. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.
Today, I want to thank you for joining us at LifePoint, and I hope our time together has been encouraging and also challenging uh, to see that Jesus is our greatest need in this very, very moment, and that LifePoint is a place in which you can experience him more. I also want to invite you this Wednesday, this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. to The Prayer Room. It's online. We'd love to see you there. This is a great place for you if you struggle in your prayer life, to learn how to grow in that. And also, if you're like a master Jedi praying person, this is a great place for you to join and uh, as one body, as one people, to lift up our needs to the Lord. So that's Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And then also, I wanna encourage you to continue to like, comment, and share our gatherings. This is a great way uh, to spread hope to our world. Jesus is our hope. People need Jesus. So would you continue to like, comment, and share. So God bless you, LifePoint. We'll see you Wednesday night at 7 p.m.